The Battle of Bosworth Field, August 22, 1485. It marked a significant turning point in English history, effectively ending the War of the Roses. This conflict was primarily between the Lancastrian claimant to the throne, Henry Tudor, and King Richard III, the last king of the House of York and the last of the Plantagenet dynasty. Richard III was killed in battle, making him the last English king to die in combat. His defeat and death paved the way for Henry Tudor to claim the throne and establish the Tudor dynasty which would rule England for the next 118 years. Thus the victory at Bosworth Field was aided significantly by the defection of key allies of Richard III to Henry's side, most notably Lord Stanley, whose intervention proved crucial at a pivotal moment of the battle. Henry's succession marked the end of the dynastic wars between the houses of Lancaster and York, initiating a period of relative stability and the consolidation of royal authority, uniting the warring factions under the banner of Tudor. Thus, the battle remains one of the most storied and pivotal clashes in English medieval history. And today we're going to learn all about it, from start to finish. Welcome to the channel, my friend. Is it your first time here? Good. It's great to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's great to have you with me again. As always, off we are on another one of our little adventures together. If you want to support the channel, guess what? You're already doing it. Just relax and enjoy the content. That's all the support I need. But if you want to go above and beyond, there is a like and subscribe button, and leaving a comment certainly helps. Tell YouTube that you want other people to share in the fun. And if you want to go further than that, well, I refer you to the video description. Now, with that out of the way, let us begin our full history of the Battle of Bosworth Field. Allow me to take you back to the Wars of the Roses. Get nice and comfortable, please. We find ourselves in the 15th century. England was embroiled in a brutal civil war as the houses of York and Lancaster desperately vied for the throne. The Yorkist faction emerged victorious in 1471 after triumphing in the battles of Barnet and Tewkesbury. The aftermath saw the demise of the Lancastrian king Henry VI and his only son, Edward of Westminster. With their deaths, the House of Lancaster lost its direct claimants to the English throne, securing Yorkist Edward IV's dominance over England. He quickly moved to secure his position by attaining his remaining foes, including Jasper Tudor and his nephew, Henry Tudor, seizing their lands and branding them as traitors. The Tudor's attempt to escape to France was thwarted by adverse weather, leading them to Brittany, where Duke Francis II detained them, recognizing their potential use as political pawns in his own game. Now Henry Tudor, despite his claim being somewhat tenuous, i.e. rooted in his mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort's lineage as a descendant of John of Gaunt, remained the last Lancastrian noble with royal blood connections, albeit a very weak one. Due to the illegitimacy of the Beauforts and subsequent decrees limiting their claims to the throne, Edward IV completely dismissed Henry. In his eyes, he was nothing but inconsequential. 
but the Duke of Brittany saw him as a valuable asset for leveraging English support against French aggression, providing him sanctuary. Edward IV's unexpected death in April of 1483 ushered in a precarious period of regency, as his young son Edward V ascended the throne at just twelve years old, with his brother Richard of Shrewsbury next in line. The young king's governance was entrusted to a royal council, which soon became concerned mainly over the apparent ambitions of Edward V's maternal Woodville relatives. The rapid accumulation of power and wealth had certainly managed to alienate many, compromising their popularity and influence. No one gets rich quickly without stepping on a few toes. In a decisive move to counter the Woodville family's control, Lord Hastings and other council members enlisted the support of the late king's brother, Richard, the Duke of Gloucester, encouraging him to take on the protectorate. Acting on his brother's wishes and council's advice, Gloucester took custody of Edward V on the 29th of April. Accompanied by Henry Stafford, the second Duke of Buckingham, and arrested key Woodville figures. Subsequently, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, executed Anthony Woodcliffe, the young king's uncle, and Richard Grey, his half-brother, on charges of treason. This solidified his grip on power, and set the stage for his own controversial claim to the throne. June 13th, Richard made a bold and decisive move by accusing Lord Hastings of conspiring with the Woodvilles, leading to Hastings' immediate execution, and he didn't even get a trial. This action was part of a broader series of controversial decisions that escalated tensions within the royal court. Shortly thereafter, on June 22nd, an assembly known as the Three Estates of the Realm, an informal version of Parliament, declared that Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was actually invalid. As a result, their children were deemed illegitimate, effectively disqualifying them from succession and clearing the path for Gloucester himself. Now, by June 26th, with his nephew's claim to the throne invalidated, Richard was proclaimed King Richard III, no longer just the Duke of Gloucester. What a promotion. The extrajudicial nature of his ascent included the execution of Hastings and the declaration regarding his brother's marriage fostered widespread disapproval and damaging rumours about him all across England. It just didn't look good. Following their bastardization, the young princes, Edward V and his brother Richard, were placed in the Tower of London, never to be seen in public again. Of course, this only deepened the mystery and controversy surrounding Richard III's reign, and, well, no doubt it was seen as quite a cruel action, locking those two lads up in the tower. By October 1483, discontent with Richard's rule had catalyzed a rebellion, primarily supported by those loyal to his brother, Edward IV, who viewed Richard as a usurper. The plot was orchestrated in part by Lady Margaret Beaufort, mother of Henry Tudor, who was promoting her son as an alternative to the throne. The conspiracy's most prominent participant was the Duke of Buckingham, a former ally of Richard III. 
The exact reasons behind Buckingham's involvement remain a little unclear. Now, there is one historian, Charles Ross. He suggests a growing desire to dissociate from an increasingly unpopular king. Could be. Alternatively, Michael Johns and Malcolm Underwood have also suggested that Lady Margaret might have misled Buckingham into believing that the rebellion would put him on the throne. Thus the game would be worth the candle. Gamble it all. Maybe so. Either way, the strategy was to simultaneously ignite rebellions in southern and western England, swiftly overwhelming King Richard III's forces. Buckingham planned to join these rebels by leading an invasion from Wales, while Henry Tudor aimed to land by sea. However, misfortunes, we may say, such as premature uprisings and adverse weather conditions, doomed the rebellion. Better luck next time. An early start to the uprising in Kent alerted Richard and allowed him time to mobilize his army to suppress the insurrectionists. Meanwhile, Richard's intelligence network uncovered Buckingham's plans, leading to strategic actions such as the destruction of key bridges over the River Severn. On October the 15th, as Buckingham reached the swollen river, a violent storm made it impossible, effectively trapping him. With no way forward, and his retreat path cut off, as his Welsh enemies seized the castle, Buckingham was forced to abandon his campaign and flee. But he was betrayed and captured shortly after. He was executed on the 2nd of November. Simultaneously, Henry Tudor faced his own setbacks. His fleet was scattered by a storm on the 10th of October, and although he briefly reached the English coast, he wisely avoided disembarking, upon realizing that the welcoming party was actually a trap set by Richard's forces. Not getting off the boat, he promptly returned to Brittany. Following the collapse of their efforts, the rebels' survivors fled to Brittany, aligning openly with Henry Tudor, who then pledged to marry Elizabeth of York, uniting the Yorkist and Lancastrian claims. This alliance posed a significant threat to Richard, prompting him to seek the extradition of Henry from Brittany. However, the Duke of Brittany, Francis II, resisted these overtures, bargaining for better terms. In 1484, with Francis incapacitated by illness, his treasurer, Pierre Landais, negotiated with Richard to extradite Henry and his uncle in exchange for military support. But fortunately for Henry, the plan was leaked, and it allowed him to escape to France, where he found refuge at the French court. The French saw Henry as a valuable chess piece against English interference in their designs on Brittany. The political landscape in England grew ever more complicated with the death of Richard's queen, Anne Neville, in March of 1485, amidst rumours that her death was orchestrated to allow Richard to marry his niece, Elizabeth of York. Well, although investigations later suggested Richard planned to marry Joanna of Portugal and arrange Elizabeth's marriage to Manuel, Duke of Beja, these rumours unsettled Henry, who saw the potential loss of Elizabeth's hand in marriage as a threat to his alliance with Edward IV's loyalists. Determined 
Henry gathered a force of mercenaries and loyal exiles, and set sail from France on August the 1st, 1485, aiming to secure his claims through a little bit of marriage and a little bit of conquest. By the 15th century, the noble English tradition of chivalrous service to the monarch had, let's just say, significantly deteriorated. Armies were typically assembled through local levies. Each able-bodied man was obliged to answer his lord's call to arms, and each noble commanded his own militia. While a king could gather a personal militia from his own estates, assembling a large-scale force required the backing of powerful nobles. Like his royal forebears, Richard III had to engage these nobles through gifts and favourable relations to ensure their loyalty. Yet these nobles wielded the power to switch allegiances if they were not sufficiently rewarded or persuaded posing a constant threat to stability. Now, at the Battle of Bosworth Field, this dynamic was certainly evident as three distinct factions converged. Richard III led his loyal Yorkist supporters. Henry Tudor arrived as the figurehead of the Lancastrian claim. And the Stanleys, influential nobles, known for their strategic hesitance, awaited an opportune moment to declare their allegiance. Richard III, though smaller and more slender than many of his Plantagenet forebears, was nonetheless very enthusiastic about engaging in rough and manly sport, which earned him a reputation that belied his physical stature. His prowess on the battlefield significantly impressed his elder brother, King Edward IV, making Richard an indispensable ally and military leader during Edward's reign. In the 1480s, Richard took on the significant responsibility of defending England's northern borders. And in 1482, under Edward's directive, Richard led an expedition into Scotland aiming to instate the Duke of Albany as king in place of James III. His forces penetrated the Scottish defences, capturing Edinburgh. However, the campaign concluded with Albany renouncing his claim in exchange for significant political power in Scotland, while England regained Berwick-upon-Tweed and secured territorial concessions. Despite these gains, Edward IV felt the results fell a little short of the potential advantages, a sentiment echoed by historians, contemporary and modern, who believe Richard could have exploited his position in Edinburgh a little more effectively. But once again, better luck next time. Among Richard's most staunch allies was John Howard, the first Duke of Norfolk, who had long served Edward IV and was deeply embedded within the Yorkist establishment. Howard, a seasoned warrior present at pivotal battles, such as Towton, and having held significant command at Calais, felt aggrieved by Edward IV's manipulation of the inheritance laws that deprived him of a substantial estate. This perceived injustice likely fueled his support for Richard III, who rewarded Howard with the Dukedom of Norfolk and restored his claims to Mowbray estate upon his accession to the throne. Henry Percy, fourth Earl of Northumberland, also aligned with Richard upon his rise to power. The Percys, traditionally Lancastrians, had shifted allegiance to Edward IV following the Earl's capture and imprisonment by Yorkist forces in 1461. Restored to his titles and lands by Edward, Northumberland had since remained a loyal servant of the Yorkist regime, 
tasked with maintaining order in the North. Though initially wary of Richard's growing influence in the North, Northumberland was placated with the promises of significant military and administrative roles. He supported Richard's Scottish campaign in 1482, and was likely motivated by prospects of enhanced power in northern England under Richard's kingship. However, once king, Richard's favour shifted towards his nephew, John de la Pole, sidelining the Earl of Northumberland, Henry Percy, in northern governance, which significantly curtailed the Earl's prospects for further advancement, and of course, led to his disillusionment with Richard's rule. One can hardly blame him receiving a raw deal. Now, Henry Tudor, soon to be King Henry VII of England, had a background markedly different from the typical monarch of his time, particularly in matters of warfare and personal inclination towards military activities. Born in Wales, and having spent much of his formative years in Brittany and France, Henry's early life was devoid of martial training, or any battlefield experience at all. His physical appearance was slender, yet it was robust, and he was noted for his reportedly decisive nature. However, he lacked the zeal of a warrior, and he was more interested in matters of commerce and engrossed in matters of finance than in those of war and conquest. Contemporary chroniclers and diplomats, including Polidor Virgil and the Spanish ambassador Pedro de Ayala, observed that Henry's interests leaned way to more administrative and economic aspects of governance and he showed very little interest in military matters at all. Indeed, he had never participated in a battle before his quest for the English crown. Recognizing his own limitations in this area, Henry took to surrounding himself with seasoned military leaders, among whom John de Vere, the 13th Earl of Oxford, was the most distinguished. Earl Oxford was a veteran of the Wars of the Roses, esteemed for his tactical acumen and combat experience. He had demonstrated his martial prowess at the Battle of Barnet, where he held the Lancastrian right wing and led them to a significant early victory. Though a tragic misrecognition led his forces suffering from a friendly fire causing them to withdraw. After a period of continued resistance against Yorkist rule, which included naval raids and an eventual capture and imprisonment, Oxford escaped and joined Henry in exile. His escape was facilitated in part by his jailer, Sir James Blond, who was swayed to support Henry's cause. The Earl's alignment with Henry Tudor significantly bolstered the Lancastrian forces morale, and of course posed a serious concern for King Richard III. Now during the early stages of the Wars of the Roses, the Stanleys, a powerful family based in Cheshire, predominantly supported the Lancastrian cause. However, Sir William Stanley a notable member of the family, aligned himself with the Yorkists. He fought at the Battle of Bloor Heath in 1459, and assisted Hastings in suppressing uprisings against King Edward IV in 1471. Despite the upheaval following King Richard III's accession to the throne, Sir William did not waver at all in his support for the new king, choosing not to participate in Buckingham's rebellion. In recognition of his loyalty, Richard rewarded him handsomely. In contrast, Sir William's elder brother, 
Thomas Stanley, the second Baron of Stanley, was more politically agile, having served under three different kings, that being Henry the Sixth, Edward the Fourth, and Richard the Third. Lord Stanley was known for his strategic indecisiveness, and that's not the best thing to be known for. Shifting allegiances between the warring factions to ensure he was always on the winning side. This approach not only secured him high-ranking positions, but also the trust of his troops, who believed that he would not recklessly endanger their lives. The relationship between Lord Stanley and Richard III was strained at the best of times. The two had a history of conflict, including a violent confrontation around March 1470. The tension was further complicated by Lord Stanley's marriage to Lady Margaret Beaufort in June of 1472, making him the stepfather to Henry Tudor. While well, despite these connections, Lord Stanley did not support Buckingham's rebellion against Richard in 1483. After the rebellion's failure, Richard spared Lady Margaret from execution, unlike other conspirators, but he stripped her of her titles and transferred her estates to Stanley, ostensibly as a trustee for the Yorkist crown. This act was likely an attempt by Richard to maintain an uneasy alliance with Stanley. Now, adding to their contentious relationship, Richard intended to revisit a land dispute that involved Lord Stanley and the Harrington family. Edward IV had previously settled this dispute in Stanley's favour in 1473, but Richard planned to overturn this decision and award the lucrative estate to the Harringtons. As the Battle of Bosworth approached, and mistrust between Richard and Stanley intensified, Richard took Lord Stanley's son, Lord Strange, hostage. This was a strategic move to prevent Stanley from defecting to Henry Tudor's side during the impending conflict. Henry Tudor, accompanied by English and Welsh exiles, as well as a contingent of mercenaries provided by Charles VIII of France, embarked on his journey to claim the English throne. Notably, the Scottish historian John Major, writing in 1521, credited Charles with supplying Henry 5,000 men, including 1,000 Scots, led by Sir Alexander Bruce, though this mention of Scottish soldiers is absent from later English historical accounts. Henry's fleet of 30 ships set sail from Harfleur on the 1st of August 1485 and landed without opposition at Mill Bay, near Dale on the north side of Milford Haven, on the 7th of August. Upon landing, Henry captured Dale Castle with ease. However, the local response was tepid. The Welsh populace did not flock to his side, and initial support from the local Welshmen was few and far between. Despite this lukewarm and lacklustre reception, Welsh bards like David Du and Gruvid Ab David hailed Henry as a legitimate prince, returning to restore Wales to its former glory. As Henry moved through Pembrokeshire to Haverfordwest, the country town, he encountered little resistance. Sir Walter Herbert, Richard III's lieutenant in South Wales, failed to counter Henry's advance, and Henry gained supporters when Richard Griffith and Evan Morgan defected to his cause with their forces. A critical ally gained during this phase was Rhys Ab Thomas, a prominent figure in West Wales. 
Despite having been appointed by Richard as the Lieutenant of West Wales for his previous loyalty during Buckingham's rebellion, Rees shifted his allegiance after Henry promised him the Lieutenancy of all Wales. That's a pretty good deal. With Rees's support, Henry's forces were bolstered by an additional 500 to 2,000 Welshmen as they marched towards English territory. By mid-August, Henry and his growing army had crossed the English border, advancing towards Shrewsbury. As soon as the news of Henry Tudor's landing reached him on August the 11th, King Richard III was swift to react. By August 16th, messengers had been dispatched to rally his nobles, with Norfolk heading for Leicester that very night. Meanwhile, the city of York, a bastion for support for Richard's family, promptly responded to the king's request for troops, sending eighty men to reinforce his army. Simultaneously, the Earl of Northumberland was gathering his forces in the north, making the lengthy journey south to Leicester to join the king. While Henry Tudor's ultimate objective was London, his march from Shrewsbury was calculated and cautious, aimed at shoring up additional support. His forces bolstered by Sir Gilbert Talbot and other English allies, including even some defectors from Richard's ranks, travelled eastward through Staffordshire. Despite these reinforcements, Henry's army remained significantly smaller than Richard's. Now, the Stanleys, we've mentioned them, who had been in correspondence with Henry even before his arrival in England, mobilized upon hearing of his landing. They positioned their troops strategically along Henry's route through the English countryside, meeting with him twice in secret to discuss battle strategies against King Richard. Their second meeting took place at Atherston in Warwickshire, where they plotted their approach to the looming conflict. On August 20th, Richard moved from Nottingham to Leicester, where he stayed overnight at the Blue Boar Inn. The following day, he was joined by Northumberland. The royal army then advanced westwards, aiming to cut off Henry's path to London. Richard chose to position his forces on Ambien Hill, believing it offered a tactical advantage. However, the night before the battle, Richard's rest was troubled, and by the morning... His appearance was notably pallid and distressed. The Yorkist army, deployed atop the ridge at Ambien Hill, was strategically positioned with a sweeping view of the battlefield. Norfolk's division, consisting primarily of spearmen and supported by roughly 1,200 archers and artillery, occupied the right flank. The centre was held by King Richard himself, leading a contingent of 3,000 infantry. On the left, Northumberland commanded a sizable force of about 4,000, many of them mounted. This setup allowed Richard to observe the movements of not only his troops, but also the Stanleys positioned along Dadlington Hill, with a force between four and 6,000 men, and Henry's advancing army from the southwest. Henry Tudor's army, though smaller than Richard's, was a diverse mix of English and Welsh recruits, along with French mercenaries and possibly a few Scottish captains. Estimates of his forces range from five to eight thousand men. The core of his army comprised of eighteen hundred French mercenaries under the command of Philibert de Chandet. While there were claims of a significant Scottish presence, they are generally discounted by historians, who argue that France 
was unlikely to have spared its elite Scottish troops for such a venture. Now, as the two armies prepared for battle, Henry initiated his approach towards the strategically advantageous Ambion Hill. Richard, from his vantage point, could see Henry's troops manoeuvre past a marsh at the base of the hill, a natural obstacle that could have hindered their advance. Amidst these tense moments, Richard attempted to coerce the Stanleys into action by threatening the life of Lord Strange, Stanley's son whom he held hostage. Stanley's indifferent reply that he had other sons led Richard to order Stranger's execution, an order that was not immediately carried out due to the imminent onset of battle. Well, certainly no Father of the Year awards for Stanley. Now Henry, aware of his precarious situation without Stanley's support, sent messengers to urge Stanley to declare his allegiance. Stanley's response was non-committal, stating he would join after Henry had arrayed his forces for battle. With no firm commitment from Stanley, Henry was compelled to face Richard's well-positioned army alone, at least for now. Recognizing the limitations of his military experience, Henry delegated the tactical command of his forces to John de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, and positioned himself safely behind with his personal guard. Oxford, cautious of the Yorkist army's superior numbers, and positioning along the Ambien Hills ridgeline, opted for a more compact formation. He instructed his troops to remain tightly packed within ten feet of their banners, aiming to prevent them from being outflanked or dispersed by the enemy. As they maneuvered to circumvent the marshy terrain near the hill, Richard's artillery bombarded the Lancastrians, challenging their advance. Emerging from the marshes, Oxford's consolidated force faced the vanguard led by the Duke of Norfolk. In the intense melee that followed, Oxford's troops displayed superior discipline and cohesion, withstanding the Yorkist assault, and causing some of Norfolk's men to flee, including the loss of a key commander, Walter Devereux. Amidst the battle, Richard faced frustration as the Earl of Northumberland held his forces back. Historians debate Northumberland's inaction. Some attribute it to personal animosities or strategic caution constrained by the narrow terrain of the ridge, which complicated any potential manoeuvre to join the fray directly. In a decisive move, Richard spotted Henry Tudor isolated from the main engagement, accompanied only by a small retinue. Determined to end the battle by eliminating his rival, Richard led a direct charge with his household knights towards Henry, aiming to kill him and thus dishearten the Lancastrian force. In this daring assault, Richard managed to kill Henry's standard bearer, Sir William Brandon, and incapacitate another key figure, John Shane, with his lance. Caught completely off guard, the mercenaries around Henry quickly adapted, dismounting and shielding him within their ranks to reduce his visibility and vulnerability. Despite the peril, Henry did not personally engage in the fight, instead relying on his guards in the chaotic melee to protect him from Richard's direct assault. John de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, had strategically positioned a reserve unit of pikemen with Henry Tudor, foreseeing the potential need for such additional protection, and this foresight proved to be critical when Richard led a mounted charge aimed directly at him. 
The pikemen effectively slowed the advance, allowing Fatuta's personal guards to encircle and protect. Amidst all the chaos, Richard found himself increasingly isolated as he engaged directly with Henry's guards. Observing Richard's precarious position, William Stanley intervened, decisively swinging the balance in Henry's favour. With Stanley's forces joining the fray, Richard's contingent was quickly outnumbered and overwhelmed, driven back toward a nearby marsh. Richard's horse stumbled, unseating him. But undeterred, Richard stood and rallied his troops, reputedly proclaiming his intent to either triumph as a king or die as one. Despite his efforts, Richard's situation deteriorated rapidly, as his standard bearer, Sir Percival Thurwall, was mortally wounded, yet heroically maintained hold of the Yorkist banner, holding it up high while the blows relentlessly hit him. He only dropped it when his heart stopped. Close associates such as Richard Ratcliffe also fell in the ensuing melee. Polydor Virgil, chronicling the battle later under Henry the Seventh's patronage, described Richard's last stand with dramatic flair, noting that he was killed manfully fighting in the thickest press of his enemies. According to other sources, including the Burgundian chronicler Jean Molinet, Richard's demise came at the hands of a Welshman wielding a halberd, striking while Richard was mired in the marsh. This violent end was echoed by findings from the examination of Richard's remains, which showed severe cranial injuries consistent with halberd strikes, indicating that he may have been helmetless in his final moments. Now, the Welsh poet, Gut or Glyn, hinted that the Lancastrian Rhys Ab Thomas, or one of his soldiers delivered the fatal blow, symbolically shaving the head of the boar, a reference to Richard's heraldic emblem. As the news of Richard's death spread, the remaining Yorkist forces, including those led by the Earl of Northumberland, quickly lost heart and dispersed, and effectively the battle was over. The Earl of Norfolk also met his end on the battle, reportedly slain by Sir John Savage. Savage by name, savage by nature, I'm sure. Now Henry Tudor, despite having a tenuous claim to the English throne through his maternal Lancastrian ling lineage, rather, ultimately had seized it by right of conquest. After his victory at the Battle of Bosworth, legend has it that Richard III's circlet was found and delivered to Henry, who was then proclaimed king atop Crown Hill, near the village of Stoke Golding. According to Henry's official historian Polydor Virgil, it was Lord Stanley himself who discovered the circlet. However, historians Stanley Grimes and Sidney Anglo refute the tale of the circlet being found in a hawthorn bush, a detail absent from many contemporary accounts. Nonetheless, some historians do consider the possibility of its significance, noting its symbolic presence in Henry's coat of arms, suggesting some basis in reality, and others point out the use of a hawthorn bush motive was already a tradition within the House of Lancaster, and Henry simply incorporated a crown into the existing symbol. Now on to the casualties. Virgil's account of them, one hundred of Henry's men to one thousand of Richard's, is viewed 
with more than a few raised eyebrows. It's likely exaggerated. Such a beat-down is rarely seen. Following the battle, the fallen were reportedly taken to St. James Church in Dadlington for burial, and in a marked show of contempt, Richard's body was denied immediate burial. Instead, it was stripped, mounted across a horse, and displayed in public in Leicester to confirm his death. Initially, Richard was placed in the Church of the Annunciation of Our Lady of the Newark, a significant Lancastrian religious institution, and after two days he was moved to a modest tomb in the Greyfriars Church. The tomb was later demolished in 1538 during the dissolution of the monasteries, obscuring the tomb's location for centuries. But, Fast forward to the 12th of September 2012. A skeleton with spinal deformities and battle-related head injuries was unearthed under a car park in Leicester, suspected to be that of Richard III. This identification was confirmed beyond reasonable doubt on the 4th of February 2013 following DNA testing by Leicester University. Richard's remains were ceremonially reinterred in Leicester Cathedral on the 26th of March 2015, and his new tomb was unveiled the next day, correcting a historical oversight and providing a resting place befitting for a former king of England. Now, Back to the old times. Henry swiftly moved to consolidate his reign, having Parliament reverse his attainder and invalidate Richard III's claim to the throne, albeit acknowledging Richard's reign in the official records of English history. The legitimacy of Edward IV's children, which had been nullified, was restored reaffirming Elizabeth of York's status as a royal princess. However, Henry postponed his marriage to Elizabeth until after his coronation, ensuring that his claim to the throne was established firmly enough to eclipse any claim she might have through her Yorkist lineage. To solidify his authority further, Henry persuaded Parliament to retroactively date his reign to the day before the Battle of Bosworth. What did this do? Well, you see, it rendered all who opposed him on that battlefield that day legally traitors. Despite his harsh initial status, Henry later demonstrated a willingness to reconcile with former adversaries. But of course, they had to submit wholeheartedly to his rule. I suppose it's better than being executed. Now on to the Stanleys. What happened to them? Well, of course, they played a pivotal role in Bosworth. Albeit they took their sweet time, but they were richly rewarded. William Stanley was made a Chamberlain, and Lord Stanley was created Earl of Derby, receiving extensive lands and titles. Henry also restored the estates and titles of John de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, and made him Constable of the Tower and Admiral of England, Ireland, and Aquitaine. Jasper Tudor was elevated to the Duke of Bedford, reflecting Henry's inclination to reward loyalty and reinforce his political base through familial appointments. Henry's mother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, benefited significantly from her son's victory. Parliament declared her a female soul, allowing her to manage her own affairs independently of her husband, Lord Stanley. This status not only elevated her position, but it allowed her direct control over her extensive estates, enhancing her influence and independence. 
despite this consolidation of power, Henry's rule was not without its challenges, of course. The first significant test came two years after Bosworth, with the rebellion led by Lambert Simnel, who claimed to be Edward Plantagenet, the Earl of Warwick. Supported by the Earl of Lincoln, a former Yorkist, this revolt culminated in the Battle of Stoke Field in 1487, where Henry's forces, commanded by Oxford and Bedford, decisively defeated the rebels. Well, this victory, however, did not completely end threats to Henry's reign, as the murder of the Earl of Northumberland in 1489 sparked further unrest. But you know, if we're going to talk about all that, I suppose it requires another video. Thank you very much for watching. Did you enjoy it? I'm sure you did. I hope you did. If you're still here, I'm sure you did. Well, I'd like to thank my top tier patrons. I know they enjoy it. It's Scott, Erin, James, Tim, Jeffrey, JC, Stark Factory, and Charles. Thank you very much. You know I appreciate you as much as you appreciate me. And thank you, dear listener, again for joining me as we go back to the War of the Roses and the Battle of Bosworth Field. What did you think about it? Maybe tell me in the comments. Good night, everyone. I'll see you again whenever you feel like coming back for another adventure into the old, old world. Love to you all. Drink plenty of water. Goodbye for now.